Hello and wonderful day and greetings from Vienna. We are having the first edition 2024 of our Tech Recruiting Academy. And today we are talking about how to develop Python, how to recruit Python developers, sorry. And I'm really happy to have these marvelous guys with me. It's Alexandra, it's Steve, and it's Hang Lee, my nice and amazing co-moderator. Today we are really spanning the globe because Hang is sitting, I'm sitting in Vienna, Hang is sitting in Hong Kong, as far as I know. Alexandra somewhere in Hungary, very close to Budapest, and Steve somewhere in Australia. And it's it looks it looks freezing cold, but he told me it's extremely hot there. So we will come to that later on. <laughs> and as we are really spanning the club today, probably uh, Steve's computer is dying or Hung's Wi-Fi connection in the hotel room. Probably we have some issues there. So please be patient with us. We try to come back all again. And I just wanted to ask Alexandra and Steve probably to give a short introduction to yourself in a few sentences. Let's start with Alexandra, please. Okay, so hi there, I am Alexandra, and I'm a bit out of line here because I uh, started my career in industrial engineering, and then I built up my own company in digital education and uh, software development, so it was quite far from talent acquisition, and then I started to work together with an innovative uh, AI development company, and they asked me to build up their talent acquisition function, and I say no. So cool. Honestly, no, uh, but they were in a need and I really enjoyed the work with this company. So I started to learn this on the fly and then I realized how incredibly interesting this area is. So I decided to change my career to talent acquisition and I started to learn sourcing. And to be honest, I became a fanatic and that's how I met with, uh, with the source code agency. So now I am a sourcing trainer. And we are dealing with sourcing and recruiting operations consultancy. So there was a career pivot from software development and engineering to talent acquisition. And now I am really, really happy with that and looking forward to this uh, session. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Steve, what about you? <laughs> no pressure. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, <laughs> Stephen, developer Steve Kuchin. Uh, well, uh, I mean, you can call me Steve, but developer Steve. Hello. Um, so I'm one of the senior developer advocates at Lumigo. Uh, we do observability or cloud-based observability, but I've been a developer for probably more years than I care to mention. Um, my first computer, for those playing along at home, was an Atari 800XL. Drop in the chat what yours was, because I love finding out that. Anyway, I've been a developer advocate for 10 years now, uh, and like I've been writing, well, building apps, writing code, tinkering with IoT things for a very long time. Since the Atari 800 XL was new, <laughs> which is a while, um, <laughs> I'm um, multi-hatted. So, uh, well, many coding languages, Python, Python, Ruby, PHP, but Python's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, uh, really great to be here and looking forward to geeking out with everyone, as usual. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I just want to do one quick announcement and really ask the audience as we can use the LinkedIn comment section and we can see that on screen. So please be as active as possible, please put in your comments, please ask questions. If you have something in mind, just drop it in the comment section. We are really loving that. And we are trying to be really on the point, also answering your questions um, within that hour that we have. And that us will lead me off to hand over to, to Hang. And Hang, I uh, would really ask you to probably explain a little bit why we came to that crazy idea to put that format together. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, I, I think it's a, to no kind of great news to anybody uh, listening to this uh, this webinar um, that you know the relationship between people who are in the technology space and the people that recruit them, uh, the technology recruiters, oftentimes can be a bit uh, antagonistic. It can be a bit distant, even at times, you know, uh, outright hostility. Um, and, you know, it seems to us that, you know, there's, there's reasons beyond uh, uh, this. Is there a way in which we can uncover some of the rationale behind uh, some of the behaviors that cause this friction? Um, and wouldn't it be a great idea to bring on someone who is a recruiter, who, uh, you know, does the work of trying to hire people uh, for companies uh, and also, you know, bring on engineers to, to, to get their perspective and their experience of being the person recruited? Um, uh, and maybe we can kind of demystify some of our behaviors here 
um, and and through that transparency, hopefully make better relationships. It's a bit of fun, you know. We're not going to solve all the problems of tech recruiting and you know uh, relationships in one hour. Um, uh, but it might be something that we'll learn something from each other, I think, when we have dialogue like this. Um, and hopefully we've set it up in such a way where we can have a free free and frank exchange, but also, you know, with the right level of humor and the, the right spirit as well. Very cool. Very cool. And I, I want to start because I, I have one question that I have, have in mind was carrying along when we developed this format already. Uh, are there differences between the different kind of species of developers? And I want to start with this question and I address it to Alexandra and Steve, of course. Is there something really specific on Python, guys? Yes, I think so. So it means that for us, it is really, really important not to ruin, for example, the engagement. So maybe, of course, Python is a quite diverse language. So and there are no strict boundaries between that. But you have to be aware uh, what is the purpose of the hiring. So maybe some kind of automation, maybe machine learning, maybe data visualization. So you can ruin all the whole engagement part if you are not respect the background of the candidate. Mm -hmm. Steve, what's your take you, on you that? You know, as as a really well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say as a really exper experienced developer oh, that doesn't stumble words. As a really experienced developer, one of the things that always grinds my gears is um, getting that 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 email saying, "Hey, I've got a really good front end junior role for you that's gonna you know that's three month contract guaranteed to go permanent." I'm like. No, like at least look at my LinkedIn profile and, you know, know who you're like approaching and what you're approaching them for. Like do some of the background um, background checks to be able to, you know, understand them, where they're coming from, where they're at, where they're at in their development cycle career or, you know, just where they're at in, in life to know how to approach them and how to, um, you know, how to really engage and make that, almost make that, make that, I don't want to say personal connection, but make that career-based connection. There we go. <laughs> um, and probably one of the other things is also to be um be more personable when engaging like you know make a reference about a rick and morty show like devs watch this stuff all the time <laughs> i know because i watch it <laughs> well i think it's really really important what you mentioned and i wouldn't like to uh search for excuses because we have to so for example advanced recruiters used to so for example uh, analyze a github repository or analyze another repository we have tools to use just a, just as a stack share so it means that we can check uh, the text uh, text stack as well and for example use glossary tech to understand the profile if we do not have the proper background to analyze uh, a linkedin profile for example so i think and I, we always highlighted during our trainings that it is really important if you of if we do not have the knowledge to assess a candidate, then we should use tools. So it means that uh, it is the best way to, to create a proper engagement with the developer. I think, I think these, um, the, uh, do you want to say something there, or should I just uh, make a point? Um, oh, no, I, just wanted to hand over, I just wanted to hand over to you and ask you what's your take on it. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I mean, I think firstly, the thing that Steve mentioned was absolutely, it's probably the, the number one consistent um, critique that uh, uh, developers have of their experience or interaction with recruiters, um, uh, which is uh, low knowledge of the, the, the domain, um, uh, lack of scrutiny of the background, uh, just sent a general sense of lack of energy um, before the outreach, so they're hitting the outreach before they've, they've even looked at the the resume or or the LinkedIn or, or the the GitHub uh, profile, and that's actually true because that outreach button goes out before anything else happens. Um, so so this again is not to excuse the situation, but it might be useful to try and explain why this occurs um, because. Um, I agree it's suboptimal, um, but it's also, I think, a problem that's not going to go away, um, we, oh, I'm sad to say. Um, and the reason for this is, is quite simply there's, there's no barrier to entry to, to do the job of a recruiter. Um, uh, yeah, what's happened here is companies have simply hoovered up someone off the street and said, right, you're a recruiter, your job is to do this, um, you will learn by doing, um, we, there's no training for you. Go ahead. Here's the database. Go and go and hire some candidates. Um, and and unfortunately, it, it's difficult to imagine or think of a circumstance where we could uh, uh, eliminate this, um, because again, anybody can set up a recruitment agency 
and anybody can start doing this work. Um, so the lack of regulation, I guess, the la lack of professionalization um, means that great recruiters like Alexandra, for instance, and the people that Alexandra trains have to compete with a constant influx of new people, basically, that don't know what they're doing and, and causing problems for everyone else. So that's not an excuse, but that's just an explanation as to why this problem is persistent. But for the for the recruiters out there that might listen to this and feel a bit depressed, it's actually a great opportunity to differentiate um, because, you know, if you've been in the game for a year plus, you've been doing it successfully and whatnot, whatnot uh, the chances are your ability to interact with developers on first contact will be significantly uh, you know, level up better than, than what they're used to getting. Um, and your path to success will basically uh, go forward. And, and what I found is that engineers typically will end up identifying a more experienced both parties get, they identify recruiters that actually have been in the game long enough and they think, okay, this person actually knows, knows what they're doing. Um, and you end up just gravitating, working um, uh, more with those folks than you would just responding uh, to, uh, to random stuff coming uh, coming in from anybody uh but yeah that's the, the explanation of the situation but opportunity and uh, a little bit of a shame that's the state of the industry uh that we have it hmm. uh it brings me it brings me further to to the, the next thing uh the, what is what is what you would like to see on 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 the companies and hr side what is uh what uh, in, in in all the years of experience that you have gathered what was probably the most annoying thing <laughs> thank you that one <laughs> hmm? um all right i'll start um sorry so when you say what's the most annoying thing do you mean as a developer being hard, looking to join a company or looking to be yeah okay um yeah, looking to join a company i think i think the the, yeah, this is this is a tricky one because I'm trying to work out how which which answer to go with because I think there's a few elements to this and the mm -hmm. reason for that is like I think in the last oh, five to ten years or so you've seen this shift of um, almost like developer ethics. There's some companies that developers just won't go to because insert reason here. It could be some more related thing. It could be like some you know whatever it is. There, there's a multitude of reasons why they wouldn't go to company X, and I think we've all seen that play out like time and time again. And I think the other thing is using the technologies that they've seen the wider industry using. And I think back to like one of my early developer jobs, oh, going back 20 years, but I'm not old, I'm not old. Um, going, back, going back a fair while where like we were using closed source things, closed source elements that I couldn't take anywhere else and say, look, I was do working on this thing, I was building this thing out, or I couldn't even show what I was doing because it's closed source. Whereas now there's well, obviously in the last uh, 10 years or so, we've seen this emergence of like open source uh, to the point now where it's almost expected companies are using it and they're contributing to it and they're, they're well, hopefully contributing it. Please contribute to it. Um, but that kind of, that helps fuel the ecosystem that developers come out of. Like they, they're, you know, learning these technologies, they're contributing to them themselves. And it just, it makes it more illustrious for them to be able to help add to that. Mm -hmm. Alexander, what's 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 your, what your opinion on it? Uh, well, it just uh, call, call me a, a pain point. So, for example, which is my pain point. Uh, so, for example, sometimes. So, I think that uh, there are good job descriptions, for example, and of course there are bad ones. So, when we share just uh, create code and uh, participate in code review, so these are the standard cliches. So I think it is really important to share project details. So sometimes we are not allowed to share specific details about the company. So this is the worst case, and this is really, really hard to manage. But if we share information about a specific project, it is quite not so easy, but we are able to get information from the hiring manager about a specific project, the tech stack, and the goals, and the opportunities. Of course, a fair pay is really important, but this is just one thing. So for example, just imagine a situation when a developer uh, changes his or her job uh, because of a higher pay. But if there is no motivation to do that, if there is no interest in that specific project, then it will be a, a failure, a real failure. 
So it means that what we can do to share, and of course, first, to collect information about the job, to collect information about the project. If we are not allowed to do so, then collect information about the team, the hierarchy, and of course, not share, for example, a pizza party and a fruit day and the flat hierarchy, a fast-paced, dynamic company, to so forget all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, this is the standard cliches in our industry, so forget them and share specific details. And I think it is really important because of the engagement, because then the developer can say that, thanks, but no thanks, this is not my cup of tea. And it's totally okay, but uh, you you haven't shared the standard cliches as uh, anybody else. So I think this is the most important part. Mm -hmm. You, you know what, just to chime in on this again, um, and I'm, I guess I'm going to try and make more excuses for recruiters here. Um, so so uh, feel free to hit me in the comments, guys. Uh, no, um, but here's one thing that a lot of people don't realize outside of the industry is that recruiters have a very variable relationship with the people that they work with. Uh, so this is true whether you're a third-party recruiter working with a, an external client, so you're essentially uh, you're an agency supplier to, to an organization, or even when you're an internal recruiter working for a, a load of hiring managers, you've got different levels of relationship uh, with individual hiring managers and individual clients. Um, and that often determines how much information you have. Um, uh, a great relationship, uh, and by the way, it's the recruiter's responsibility to try and develop that relationship. Um, a great relationship, you've got a one-to-one -one with a hiring manager, you've got a deep, deep brief, you understand exactly what the, the projects are, why this role exists, why, what kind of person they're looking for, and you're able to relay that information to the candidates that you can speak to. Worst case scenario, you just get a job spec thrown over the wall, and it's like, go and recruit that, I need 10 people yesterday, and they won't talk to you. Um, and for whatever reason, you might just be forced to go out into the marketplace and guess what? You ain't got anything to go with. Um, and again, you can argue that a recruiter may want to refuse that opportunity and say, listen, you know, I can't work to, to, to very loose specifications like this. I find that more experienced and more confident recruiters might do that. Um, but again, a younger recruiter, a recruiter doesn't have the options or, you know, uh, isn't in a, in a high status position within their business, might be forced to go ahead and do that. And then hence, they've got very thin conversations to have uh, with, uh, with the, uh, the candidates. I think the way to play that, by the way, if you are recruited in that situation, is to be straight up front with the candidate um, and just say, listen, I haven't had time to have one-to-one -one dialogue with the hiring manager on this one. Just sent over this specification. Uh, this is as far as I know. I'm going to try and get more information, but just get a feel for how you feel about it. So don't pretend that you know if you don't. Just be very, very clear and transparent about your level of relationship. Another conversation you can have is, look, it's the first time I've worked with this uh, this hiring manager. Um, I haven't had the chance to do a Zoom with him, uh, but I thought, you know, it just came across your background. It looked like Spawn. I thought I'd just let you know straight away. You can have that conversation, establish the, the status straight away, and that can often diffuse any kind of um, pressure you might feel um, to be yes your way through the call, basically. So you want to avoid that situation. And you can just be more honest with it. Yeah. Well, I think it is really, really important. And there is one small thing, and we have to be conscious about that. So, for example, uh, I always ask the hiring manager managers to share one uh, thing that is not not good about the job. Of course, you have to be conscious about it, so not share mm. something sensitive. But for example, for me, uh, it was quite easy to share something that is not good, to be honest. Because for me, it helped a lot to be at a connection. But of course, of course, I know it can be a dangerous weapon. But if you do it while doing it conscious, then it can help you a lot. Uh, create a meaningful uh, conversation with the developer. And it is just one thing. Mm. Uh, do you ha have something else in mind, a question which you could raise? Uh, because... Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I could keep going on. Um, just don't, don't want to keep talking and dominate the chat here. But, um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think... Again, Alex has actually put a really good tip in. I mean, this, mm -hmm. this is so useful for any recruiter at any level. And it's actually quite a challenging conversation or question to have with the hiring manager. Um, and it forces the hiring manager to actually evaluate, you know, why is that vacancy? Why does that vacancy exist? Oh, could, because you know, your senior guy resigned. Like, okay, do you know why? Um, you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be a horror story, but there must be, you know, is there a reason behind that? Um, and that can 
be used as a, a as, as as a way to have a conversation with a more suitable candidate uh, who you know might it might just be uh, more fit for that person's career trajectory at that point. So don't be don't be afraid to have that conversation. Why does that vacancy exist? What is the toughest part about this job? Um, uh, you know, I think that's uh, everyone's uh, everyone is mature enough to to, to recognize that it's not ro- roses and rings out there. Um, you know, every job needs a bit of work to do. So uh, I think that's great uh, a great technique, Alex. Actually, I want to add add to that Steve, too, if I can, because yeah, I, I was I was thinking about this in uh, a few minutes ago. Was I've heard plenty of instances. Actually, we saw this play out, so I don't have to mention any company names that maybe didn't make the media, but. Um, Plenty of instances where you have the head of a the you know the the a coding like a coding group or a coding team or part of the SD, SDLC, for example, leave, be walked out, whatever the reasons are, but the whole team will go with them. And yeah, as I can imagine, that would be quite tricky uh, as recruiters to then explain that, particularly if it has been in the media say with our friends at OpenAI, for example, which we saw play out late, late last year. Like that would be. That would be tricky to explain and then also fill, I would imagine. <laughs> mm. how, how would you deal with that, Alex? Um, you know, where there's like a, a PR scenario with, uh, with an employer for whatever reason. I and mean, we've, seen, we've seen it happen with all these layoffs, for instance. Oftentimes you lay off in one, one department, but you persist in recruiting in another. Um, wh- what's, what's your recommended approach in that situation? Mm, to use the company PR or the employer branding, just to be sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it, it makes sense to, to 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 be on message, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's it's a difficult one because um, I think um, let's say two years or so ago, before let's say the big tech winter, two years or so ago, everyone was flying high, wasn't it? It was, mm. it was a very frenetic time. Yeah. Everyone was charging forward. It felt very, I wouldn't say easy to recruit. It was one of those where actually it, the opportunities were flowing very freely um, and we had di- different sets of challenges then. But now I think everyone is a little bit more wary, a little bit more reticent. Um, we've all kind of had our confidence chipped away by these layoff stories that kind of drip, drip through um, and all of us are feeling, okay, maybe I keep my head down until things settle down a little bit. Um, so yeah, lots of interesting recruiting challenges. Uh, that we need to go through. Um, let's see. Let's, 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 let's. So I think what is really important to to think ahead. So for me, whether it is a great economy situation or the worst, so what is really important in each case is to think ahead. So for example, build connections, uh, not just when you are uh, a vacancy, but on a on a daily basis. So for example, what is quite unique in Python that they, they have a really active uh, community. Of course, so you have a lot of options, not just on LinkedIn, so just check the python.org or for Django, just check the Django news and uh, Django project.com and so on and so on. Of course, uh, they had the communities, they have the communities in machine learning as well. So it means that to build connections, not just when you had an urgent request for your hiring manager, I know that, uh, all of them, you know, when you have to fill a position for yesterday or the day before yesterday. So it means that you can uh, use. Uh, so, of course, I know that recruiters do not have too much free time, but when you are active in a community venue, uh, so for example, just to read the Stack Overflow survey or the JetBrains survey, it can help you a lot understand the market, understand the candidates, where are they, what are they interested in. It. And for example, what was my sweet spot, just check in in a, a meetup group or something like that, because it can help you understand the market, help you prepare for the changes. So it means that you won't be the last to hear about uh, an economic issue or something like that. So I think uh, stay near to the fire is really important for recruiters and, and, and for those who are searching for Python developers as well, because it changes as well on a daily basis. Mm. Uh, just going to add to that too, because that's a really good point. Um, yeah, please get involved with community projects. Even actually, I'm going to put it. I'm going to go one step further and do something I don't think anyone's done before, and that is recruiters. Please also contribute to an open source project. Now you don't have mm. to code anything. You can just edit readmes. It's really good and it helps mm. them. Anyway, that's a whole other whole other talk in its own right. But um, if you are going along to meetups, one thing I will ask is please don't go broadcasting that you are a recruiter. 
just go there as an interested person looking to, you know, get close to communities. I mean, you can tell people just don't run around giving them your business card, which I have seen people do. Don't do that. This is the key. So, for example, when you go to a community and say that ah, I am a recruiter, I have vacancies, so that won't work. <laughs> so, uh, just like when you uh, are falling in love with someone, so yeah, so don't start with, with other parts. So, it means that when you join a company, <laughs> be there, be visible, and of course, be useful. So, I think it is really important and not just mm -hmm. when you need something. So, be useful, be share the useful things share other opportunities, of course, support other recruiters as well. So for me, it, it worked really, really well. And and as I mentioned, when you are not in an urgent need, so this is really important. Hmm. We got two you, nice you know what, comments. Just... Sorry. And we got no, two nice just, comments from you. Gonna... Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. We, we, we've got two, two comments from you and Eowyn. So I hope I pronounce it right. And he, he said, uh, base the coding exercise on actual tasks they would have in the role and not the theoretical exercise. That was one of his comments. Uh, what's your takes on this? Uh, I mean, Steve, probably you first. Oh, I hate doing live coding. <laughs> and I do it all the time. But it's usually, um, no, uh, with those, um, live coding as well. So yeah, <laughs> I realize. Yeah, for, like, yeah. For, yeah, for job things too. Like, oh, and yeah, I have to move the robot around the thing and get them to go into the box. Like, yeah, I can do it. But like, oh, anyway. Um, but I think this is where like um, one thing I always encourage like new devs to do is, you know, contribute to GitHub repos, write articles, like demonstrate what you can do. In fact, build a CV website. I tell everyone to do that. Like domain names are so cheap. Clouds will give away credits like they're candy. Like build build something small. Doesn't have to be elaborate, but sh like demonstrate your skills, show what you can do. And then maybe we can mitigate and not have to do those coding challenges. But anyway, there's nothing wrong with coding challenges. Yeah, not everyone likes them. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the important thing is to you know show what you can do. Yeah. I mean, it, it underlines for me, uh, Owen's, Owen's con uh, comment uh, underlined what what we already discussed. I think a little bit is that it should if it's if it's happening, it should be connected to the role and not a kind of a theoretical examine to check uh, if this guy is really able to code something. Yeah, because normally they they can. Yeah. Yeah, and then to be honest, but this is just a short uh, note that as a recruiter, I always hated the live coding. So it means that it takes for me a lot of energy to to create a, a peaceful atmosphere. Of course, yeah. say that it is not an exam, just please, just please be calm. So yeah, it, it doesn't work. So, so it means that uh, sometimes it is good for some of the developers, but others uh, also hate that kind of live coding. So, mm -hmm. and of course, to be honest, I would hate the live sourcing as well. <laughs> so for me, it's important to think about it, to build up a strategy, to build up a workflow. And what the interviewer see that I just sit somewhere uh, in silence, so it is not the best main card to an interview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I was going to jump the, in with... Oh. Go ahead, okay. Oh, I was gonna say. I, I was gonna say. I was going to uh, say the worst. Like, I'm gonna classify this as a coding challenge uh, that I had to do for uh, a recruitment pro as part of a recruitment process for a company one time. Uh, that company makes big blue clouds. I won't say who, but I'm sure you can figure it out. But anyway, uh, it actually wasn't a coding challenge of sorts. Like, I didn't have to write any code per se, but it was like a, um, a puzzle challenge. And you had to do so as many puzzles as you could within a time frame. I think it was like an hour. And the thing was, you could never finish. There was no end. You literally had to run out of time, and that was the challenge. There was mm -hmm. no right answers. There was no wrong answers. But as long as you did them, then, yeah, you could pass and so like but they didn't tell you that and you didn't find that out until you get into the company and people go oh yeah i don't even know what my score was and you're like well why did i stress about that anyway that was the worst coding type challenge i've ever done <laughs> anyway but what is the message in that case so for example it's for me just like when you use brain teasers as interview questions so i hate them and never use them so it means that i wouldn't like to seem to be funny and smart because the interview is not about me. I am there to share information about the company and other stuff and to find mm -hmm. out whether there is a, a fit 
uh, for company culture and so on, but not to be funny and smart with brain teasers and, and such challenges. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, I still don't know, but it was, I think it was something to do with being under pressure and having continual tasks, but it was literally like, it'd be four, four multiple choice box, boxes and there'd be sometimes written questions with like sums and stuff. And then sometimes there'd be like shapes all placed together and you had to mm -hmm. choose various ones for various reasons and which one do you think and stuff. But I think it was more about the, the pressure of the task at mm -hmm. hand, whether you yeah. knew the answer or didn't know the answer. But yeah, I, I, I don't get it either. But I think it would behave uh in a different way when you are at an inter in an interview and at a company so i think that there would be a change in that mm. yep. no i agree uh incidentally i did get the job so <laughs> not this one, not another one. <laughs> Good news. i still don't know my score <laughs> <laughs> You know, you wanted to when say you talk something. about assessments, it, yeah, I mean, talking about assessments, I think it's quite an interesting um, uh, sort of area to debate because how explicit should a recruiter be on what the expectations are going forward? I mean, it, my instinct tells me the more ex transparent you are as to what the assessment process is, um, is really going to help you have a, a better conversation because there's going to be certain people that are simply not have the capacity or the time or the interest to go and invest in a you know eight round interview sort of process it's just not right for everyone at that point in time um but maybe they'll you know if it's two rounds wherever you can shoot through okay maybe we'll go so one of the things i would guess a, rec a recruiter should do uh, whether you're a third party supplier um or whether you're an internal recruiter is that you've got to understand how the hiring manager intends to then recruit sort of assess the candidate uh, and then have that information right up front um, to say, look, um, if you are interested, here are the procedures. Um, uh, I just want to let you know right, uh, immediately that's the commitment if you want to step forward. Um, how do you think you go about having that conversation, Alex? I mean, if you're in a situation where, you know, send me the candidates, that's the, the instruction from the hiring manager, um, and they've not really divulged you know, how they then intend to do the assessment. Um, what What's the approach that you would take to try and get that information out of them? Okay, so first, what is really important for us to do the homework, which means that uh, most of the Python developers are quite active, as I mentioned, in different communities on Kaggle, for example, or uh, the Python package index or uh, other uh, framework or library connected communities. So it means that don't steal the time from each other. So it means that first, what is really important to collect information about repositories, about the complexity of the code, to ask the, the developer to share some of the details of their project, because it will be useful for the hiring manager as well. What is, on the other hand, but you mentioned it, to share in advance the, the, pro, the process of the hiring, which is really important. So not to be shy about it. So if you have a tech test, if you have an interview and a second interview, share it in advance. Of course, not in the first outreach message because it will break the whole thing. But uh, when you had a proper engagement, then please be honest about the whole process. That there will be a uh, test, there will be an interview uh, because it will build trust. Maybe, so for me, it was quite hard because we had long processes. Uh, and it is really well, not, not my best part, but there's best days to be honest, but to share this information and of course, collect the information and share it with the hiring manager. But of course, not in a long story. So not share, for example, repositories. Of course, if they are interested, just share it. But now, as I mentioned, we have tools to analyze just like uh, ChatGPT plugins to check the different repositories and do that and share the information in a proactive way. Uh, so this is what is really important. And for the assessment, I always try to convince the hiring managers that please do not choose the longest uh, processes in the industry because they will lose the candidates. And I think it is really important because some of the hiring managers are not conscious about that this is a real danger, that the process is too long, then we will lose the candidates. And of course, we cannot keep warm candidates for weeks. This is the other part that, uh, for example, when you say somebody that, OK, you are cool for this position, but please wait four weeks uh, and then I will go back. So, yeah, that's that's not the, not the best part. 
of the work. But first, so do the homework, share the information, and, and be proactive uh, with the hiring manager and, of course, with the candidate as well. So, yeah. We, we got a comment from Mark, and Mark said the challenge with hiring developers is that we often default that we often default theoretical assessments, which only test a limited amount of data points. What's your take on this, Alexandra? So the challenge with hiring developers is that you often default it, which only tests limited amount. And uh, well, but I think it is really important to ask the candidates. So, for example, to share details about their previous work, about their previous project. And what I think it is really important that you, to test the analytical mindset. So, for example, I am not a true fan of long uh, developer tests because mm. it will steal time from both parties. Uh, and I think it is really, so I just share a short story. So, for example, we realized that we had a candidate from uh from a university and he had a quite weak python knowledge quite weak uh so the the interview was almost a nightmare but he has a so strong analytical mindset and algorithmical thinking and a quite great background uh in, in academic sciences then we decided to hire him and it was one of our best decisions because this is what matters so just to do some skill-based tests and not the not uh, not the question that uh, what is your favorite color, so no, so I, I don't think about it, but to ask to test the algorithmical thinking to ask for previous project details, because it will have the team to assess the knowledge. So it means that we, in that case, we do not have to share uh, two day long tasks and so on and so on. So I think this is the key to check the thinking and not to, not to uh, ask dumb questions. <laughs> uh from the developer we we got we got another com comment on my question from which one how many rounds are essential to judge the candidate and i expect two different answers from alexandra and steve now, <laughs> <honestly>. Start, steve. <laughs> you know i've actually helped hire multiple people in multiple companies now because part of what i do as a developer advocate is i'm I'm kind of linked into a lot of different departments inside a company and wear many hats to many people for many reasons inside a company. And so going through some big, some of the, um, especially in the bigger orgs, a lot of the, because I do a lot of um, developer facing engagements, so public speaking and that as well, um, is often we'll also be promoting, you know, there's developer jobs now available, come see us, et cetera. So um, we were part of, I've actually been part of a gate. Well, I also have been a CTO as well. Probably should have mentioned that one too. So I've actually hired developers anyway. Um, yeah, a lot of the time through like in that, in that capacity, like I'm also partly gatekeeper for that too, because I could then use my technical knowledge and be like, yeah, they, they know what they're talking about, or eh, maybe they might need a bit of a test, even though I don't like, them. um, you know, I can be that prompting, prompting voice to say, you know, they may be good fit or may not, et cetera. Um, that's in my light capacity. Sometimes I've done that. Um, but I think the, yeah, I think the, the, the tricky part is doing that that assessment and quite often you'll have um, the persona types that won't be that outgoing either so they'll they'll want to apply but maybe won't and will need that encouragement where you can you know say hey you'd be a great fit for this you should apply you know can help you through the process etc like be that be that guiding light if you will to help get them into a you know um, um, into an into a good job place mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, what is the answer to the question, though, Steve? You can't get away without a number here. What is the optimal <laughs> number of rounds? Well, actually, uh, um, I'm going to say none. No. Um, you know what? <laughs> I reckon by at least the third one, I would hope somebody, well, as as somebody that's applied before, if at least it's uh, at least by the third one, I'm going to have a good sense whether I'm going to be a good fit and whether they think I'm going to be a good fit. You're going to kind of start to feel that. In saying that, and again, I'm not going to mention any names, although I really want to because ugh, um, I have been through maybe nine with one particular company. But anyway, I'm not saying who because anyway, <laughs> reasons. Um, yeah, I think once you start to get to that point, it's like, no, <laughs> we're not going to work. Because, um, yeah, that's just dragging it on for internal working, company working sake more than, you know, yeah, mm. more than it should be. Hmm. 
So three. Three is my short answer. Three. Okay. <laughs> Alexandra. Well, <laughs> I try to avoid the exact number, but uh, yeah, it depends on the rule, I think. Uh, but what is really important, I think that, and I will share the number as well. So, <laughs> try to find out. Uh, so what is really important to be conscious about the different roles of each phase. So it means that try to avoid the repeatable part, the redundancy. So for example, when I uh, lead a screening call, I try to, of course, I assess as a pre-screening, of course, uh, the knowledge of a candidate and I share information about the company. And I think it is my job. So for example, I wouldn't recommend a, a startup job to a nine to five mentality person because I would recommend him or her another job. So it means that this is the meaning of the screening call, for example, to assess mm -hmm. some of the technological knowledge, technology knowledge and to share information, of course, and assess the, the culture fit. And then we usually have a, a text te te test uh, interview and maybe an online test, but we try to make it as short as possible. And it depends on the role, but we had some kind of leadership or management interview. Uh, sometimes we ask to, to manage a, a team fit interview, but to be honest, it so you have to be well prepared for that. So for example, when there are 20 people, uh, who are quite nervous because uh, it is just like a, a blind rendezvous or something like that. So it can be quite hard. But if you ask me, I would say that around three. So it means that a screening call may be a test online and uh, and a tech interview, and that's all. Uh, so I think uh, in that case, we want to lose the candidates as well. Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, I forget the name of a company who did really good study on this. And in terms of how the, the attrition rate of candidate dropouts, um, the, uh, according to the number of, of events you ask them to go through. Um, and I think the like the optimal was three. In other words, you can be too quick. Um, and in fact, it, it, at peak, you know, 2021, we, we saw some commentary from developers to say, listen, I, I, I seem to have immediately be given an offer of a job mm -hmm. where I like, literally with very, very little um, stake, uh, you know, assessment. And it was like, you know, the guy, you just get him in. And that's too quick. There's not enough information for the decision to be made, no matter how big the money, uh, the number looks like. Uh, but you can obviously drag it out too long as well. So optimal, I think, is probably three Two may be a little bit too short, depending on experience. Mm -hmm. um, maybe two is okay for a, a junior type of role. Um, uh, but yeah, anything four and above, you, unless they're managerial and, and they've got to do multiple stakeholder interactions, uh, there's there's no real reason to do that. And probably, I'm add, uh, okay. probably the name of the, the company who did, who did the sewer was with developers. We found out the same thing. So it's not <laughs> 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 Just forget the company. <laughs> I, I, I failed. I, I failed to, to, to embellish we are developers brand. I mean, I, I got no, fired no, for the next show. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Well, but we did a study and we came to the same results. So we we ask that on a regular basis within our surveys, which we do on a yearly basis. And I think three is the optimum. But that's a really nice comment. And I would ask uh, probably Steve to read through it from Mark because he was asking. Yeah. What does oh, yeah. think, Steve think about that approach? Could you go through the lines, please, and give an answer on for Mark, please? Yeah, so um, actually, yeah, I did read that one, and I thought it was great too. But um, So Mark says, what I normally do is ask them about a project they did and are proud of uh, and made an impact. What was the challenge? How did you solve it? And why did you take that approach? One, opens up conversation. Two, shows mindset. Three, if they shows if they had ownership. Four, shows um, the tech they worked on. Yeah, I actually really like that because yeah, as as a passionate dev myself, like I need to believe the things that I'm building out, you know, are going to help somebody in some way, and even just in some little way. Like, but I'm still going to take ownership of that code, and from there on in, like I own it, I'm proud of it, I build it out. So yeah, I actually really like that, and yeah, that. I have nothing else to add. <laughs> Other than, I love, yeah, I think I that's love this approach. Phenomenal. So the best conversations uh, come yeah. from this approach. So I love it. Yeah. Do you think? Let's let's uh, one question on this. Do you think? And this is both to both Stephen and Alexander. Um, do you think that the current state of the marketplace um, is going to help improve, like the candidate experience, um, because? companies are hiring at a slower rate there's less pressure 
uh, to, you know, we got to hire 50 people yesterday um, uh, and simply slower pace uh, so that, you know, our, our company is now more able to go to a more considered approach. Let's do these three interviews, uh, three sessions. Let's make sure we have that one to one as, as, as a very key part of component of that exercise. It seems to me that when it was like we ha had to hire at this frenetic pace, um, we had a scaling problem. Like the the, the engine, senior engineers were not available to do that in those interviews. There was stress. You were completely overloaded uh, asking them to do stuff. Um, therefore, you threw a bunch of technical tests at people because you're trying to avoid overstressing your current incumbent developers. And of course, that isn't a, a, an optimal uh, case. Um, do you think now that we've slowing down the hiring, we might actually be able to put into place uh, you know, better candidate experience. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on that, guys? You want to go? Oh, wait. I, I actually I wanted to. I got two two thoughts on this. One, I almost as an advocate, like I've, I've been through a bunch of companies as a, as a developer advocate. Now, I almost got hired once by a bank, which was interesting to be an internal developer advocate for dev teams being hired into the bank and getting them all set up with their laptops and stuff, which not quite what an advocate does, but I mean, kind of what an advocate does, I guess. But that was probably one of the more unusual dev advocacy jobs I've seen or been looked into. Didn't go ahead, obviously, but, um, but I think that just kind of sort of started to go down that path of, yeah, looking at more the um you know maybe not as many but uh trying to look after the ones you were getting in a little bit better and sort of train them up a little bit better and get them kitted out um more thoroughly then um yeah and i agree the market um a number of years ago it was that whole like you know hire all the people all now like we want them now and you would see like hundreds of devs get spun up in you know whatever corporate environment whereas now i think the market's still readjusting itself after a major correction and i don't know that it's completely done yet but it's definitely an interesting time as we go through a precipice of revolution almost the ai revolution is obviously spurring still a little bit of instability but at the same time there's an appetite there and it started to come back and i've started to notice it more too just not only from the number of emails I'm getting because like all these roles are available. It's like cool, they can be available. Um, but yeah, you're starting to it's starting to feel like it's opening up more. And even conferences like late last year, you could see companies were wanting to spend more again because they could feel the conditions changing. So I think we're still in that flux phase mm. a little bit. Yeah, I, I think and feel the same about the correction and but I think that uh, being a junior developer now, it's it's not an easy thing. So it means that uh, what we realized that we had a lot of applications from uh, entry stage com uh, entry stage uh, candidates. So it is not an easy uh, situation now. What is really important to to build their repository, build their portfolios, because it will help a lot to to have a competitive advantage to others. But what we realized that uh, there is still a struggle for senior developers. So that's really interesting that uh, there is a quite big gap now in the market. And as uh, ChatGPT introduced, now people just reinvented AI, for example, which is for me quite funny because uh, I worked for an AI company well before ChatGPT. And we realized that uh, the hiring completely changed after that. So, so it means that now there is a, a great need uh, to find experienced Python developers who are specialized in TensorFlow, Keras, uh, and other uh, frameworks and libraries. So it means that uh, now, we, or, or for example, PyTorch. So now it is in a, there is a high need uh, for those professionals. So it means that it is it can be quite uh, interesting for recruiters and, of course, developers too to uh, be at their career and, of course, to focus on that people because I think that there will be bigger and bigger hiring need for that people. So it means that mm -hmm. uh, later, what was really important, for example, to find Django developers. So that was the, the popular one. But now, but now in last year, uh, we just got requests to find uh, uh, Python developers with some computer vision experience and so on and so on. So there is a change. And this is why I mentioned that we have to follow uh, the industry service because uh, these are gold mines, I think. The Stack mm -hmm. Overflow, JetBrains, and so on and so on. So you can get a lot of information for that regarding the market. 
And of course, it is changing. So it is just like the sourcing. So it will keep us young. <laughs> <laughs> to adapt. Yeah. I have one question um, in mind, probably it's a really silly question, because I honestly have to state that I'm not no really an expert in Python and the technology. But for me, it seems, as what I know about it, it's probably more open and more has a more interfaces into the in, in, out to the world than than probably other other uh, languages, and so for me there's one question in mind from a soft skill point of view are the differences in 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 getting good Python developers compared to other other languages because you need to interface with a lot of other parts of the world. Let's let's formulate it like this. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it was, as I mentioned, the analytical mindset and the openness. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, what was their background needs? So, for example, they just like to automate something or they would like to go deeper and do, do other stuff. So, it means that uh, Python is a quite uh, versatile and really diverse language. So, it means that it is quite easy to start to use it. But, of course, it is not so easy to become an expert in that. But it means that we have a quite big pool. So just uh, enter a Python developer to LinkedIn. But there will be a big difference because it seems to be big, but to find uh, an experienced developer can be quite challenging. And for me, it was the algorithmical thinking and the openness, of course, to, to mm -hmm. other, uh, other libraries, frameworks, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Steve? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Just to add to that, I think. Well, um, I mean, I'm multi-hatted on the language front anyway. But Python for me is that um, that really extensible language. Like I can literally use it on uh, deploy to a container. Actually, this week I was I was working in Django, <laughs> as it so happens, on uh, on a blog post that I was I got coming up. Um, but over the years, like I've used uh, MicroPython on. Um, I love IoT things. I actually, actually, I used MicroPython one time. I bought a, bought a coffee table. It looked like a big iPad, and I thought, "Gee, that'd be great to put 600 LEDs in." So I did, and connected to the smart house just because I I don't have it anymore. But anyway, um, it's one of those extensible languages you can do so much with. Like you can put it in a coffee table, you can deploy it to a cloud. Like it is really, really cool. Um, and I think this is the other thing is um, uh, most devs will do is you'll use it. You, the skills you have, you'll use for everyday things around you, and also, you know, um, building stuff out of, um, in an app form, and then also just projects that you think could be fun. Uh, and we've seen this so many times and time again. Um, but I think it, the important thing is to be that extensible and you know push your own skills uh, in your own projects as much as you will during you know your daytime projects. Or so probably shouldn't say daytime now because well, we all work weird hours working remote. So in hours. <laughs> Han, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, we're coming to the end of uh, end of our conversation. It's like so much more to say. It feels like um, we're going to necessarily leave stuff unsaid, um, <laughs> and maybe that's an excuse for us to uh, to, to to redo. Uh, I have a part two uh, on this topic because I think Python is, I believe it is the most popular language that's cited by developers now. So it's, it's, it becomes so ubiquitous um, that in every, I think it's going to maintain its position going forward. So probably it's going to be an area of interest um, uh, 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 for us to have further conversation of this type. However, there's one thing we didn't really cover, and I think we need to we need to just uh, uh, take a step and, and, and try and cover that last couple of minutes. Um, are there any de behaviors from Python developers um, that are annoying for recruiters? Um, I mean, is there any specific kind of things that de Python developers do that you know you think you know what? What on earth is that all about? Um, you know, or it, it, it's kind of counterproductive for what this person wants. I don't understand. Um, anything like that, Alexandra? Any thoughts on this? Uh, feel free to uh, generalize at risk of your own reputation. Um, <laughs> Can I be honest? <laughs> okay, so Honesty just one... is the only thing that we require. <laughs> okay, so just just one thing, uh, and I try to be PC as well. So, for example, before the AI hype, when you had a position for Python developer, they just say that, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And after the AI hype, they just feel that oh, I am the superstar. So there was a quite big change, uh, of course, because of the market changes. And it's completely OK. Just check. And I wouldn't like to be 
uh, unfair because it was the same with IT recruiters uh, during the COVID, after the COVID. So there was a quite uh, there were quite big differences. What is important, I think, to be a little bit so to be humble and to to be conscious about the market can change and it is true for all of us so maybe mm -hmm. one day we will be the rock stars and maybe the next day we will be the grateful ones who will be happy when a recruiter just ask uh, ask uh, or give uh, a position yeah. so i think this one and i just sorry but i have seen a comment that uh, python uh, communities just a short note that I am happy to share a one pager with that uh, because I have a collection. We just shared it uh, a year ago uh, in social media. I'm happy to share it in the comments later. So with mm -hmm. the Python communities. So Thanks for that. Super helpful. And, and you know what? That's all about abundance mindset, isn't it? I don't think it's specific to particularly to Python, but simply because of the surge in demand inevitably yeah. if you're getting offers every day you're going to be more dismissive of those offers yeah. simply because you know it can come around you, you, your your mind is now thinking okay every single day i'm getting another offer so i don't need to care too much about this it's quite a difficult one to try and wrestle with but yeah i think it doesn't suit anybody to fall too much in love with your attention um because it can switch very suddenly um mm -hmm. and you, ne you actually never know some of these opportunities could be very very much worth pursuing steve you're going to say something i think i was actually going to circle back to one of the things i was saying at the very start and that is devs will for the right project they will go and if they believe in what you're doing they will mm -hmm. join you um and to test with that and actually to reverse answer a question a few questions ago like uh, how many is too many to do an interview my current role, I did two interviews for, and by the second one, I actually had um, a, a interview with Erez, one of the co-founders of the company, and we had half an hour booked out. And by the end of two hours, we'd been talking for two hours. <laughs> and by that stage, mm. I was like, "Yeah, let's let's do it." I'm, you know, I'm, I mean, mm. I want to join. I believe in what you're doing. Mm. I want to come do it too. So um, it was it was actually the shortest interview process I ever had, but I mm. believe in what we're doing. So anyway, mm. I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Yes, I mean we are one minute to I think one and a half minutes to two twelve. So the time passed by extremely quick in this round. So thank you very much for all of you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Alexander, for thank joining you. us. Uh, thank you, Hung. Thank you. Uh, I know that Steve has already got a long weekend in front of him, and it's already I think ten in the evening, something like this. Yeah, I think yep. uh, if you look at <laughs> outside of Hang's uh, window, it became dark as well. So thank you very much for being with us. I want to have one important message, which I also want to not forget, because there's a guy in the background who is always helping me running this format, and it's Nico. And Nico is the nice elf in the background. He's not visible, yeah, but he's in the background. I know he's listening, and he is his birthday today. So he spent his birthday for running the show with us so happy birthday nico and thank you very much for being with us thank you very much for joining us if you have comments the channel stays open so just drop your comments we are really looking forward to answer everything later on as well alexander already mentioned that you will share this kind of document so thanks for for being with us and see you the next time i think the next session is already planned uh we stay on stay tuned on this channel and we keep you posted there so Thanks to all of you and hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>